Hello, my interweb learning peeps. Since my return video, we have released videos on linkage institutions, the indestructibility of a bull moose, and of course, a video on cannibalism in history. So I figured it was time to go back to one of our favorite topics, U.S. Supreme Court cases. So I wrote 100 potential cases down on little pieces of paper. I put them in a hat and I picked one out. And the winner, one of the AP government exam's most favorite court cases, the 1995 landmark case, U.S. versus Lopez. A case involving schools, guns, and the interstate commerce clause. So why don't we throw all three into a metaphorical blender of understanding and see if we can't mix up a cool, refreshing drink of learning. Cheers, my learning friends. Let's drink up. Before we dive into the specifics of what happened to Alfonso Lopez Jr., a 12th grader at Edison High School in San Antonio in Texas on March 10th, 1992, before Alfonso's life was turned upside down. We need to travel back two years earlier when Congress passed as part of the Crime Control Act of 1990, the Gun-Free School Zone Act of 1990. In an attempt to create safe gun-free schools, the act banned the possession of handguns within a thousand feet of a school. And it's noted that the belief that banning guns creates less violence itself has its loyal backers and diehard opponents, but that's not what this video is about. I'm sorry. Now, as students of government, I know you're already asking the question, with what part of the Constitution did Congress tap into in order to give itself the power to pass such a law? So if we skim through Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, which dutiful lists the types of powers Congress is bestowed with, I promise you, you're not going to find the words regulating in guns anywhere near each other. In fact, the Second Amendment has language which many would interpret as preventing Congress from passing any sort of gun regulation. Well, Congress had an answer. Its constitutional power to do so lay in the Interstate Commerce Clause with a little bit of a dose of the Necessary and Proper Clause mixed in. Now, the Supreme Court first allowed Congress to use the Interstate Commerce Clause combined with the Elastic or Necessary and Proper Clause way back in 1824 in the landmark case Gibbons versus Ogden, which dealt with regulations on navigable rivers. The interstate nature of waterways made it constitutionally permissible for Congress to pass federal laws related to such issues. But I know you knew that already. Now, later during the Progressive and the New Deal era, the court further broadened the interpretation of the Interstate Commerce Clause based on the idea that it could be tied to interstate travel. It could be regulated due to the facts nearly all industry involved itself in crossing state lines. And the court also rationalized that Congress could address a broad range of interstate economic activities that had a substantial effect on interstate commerce and the national economy. <laughs> So now we bring ourselves to guns. In the eyes of Congress, guns near or in schools was bad, very bad, it's dangerous. So a law was necessary and proper to address the problem. And according to Congress, guns were an example of economic activity. And even if confined to interstate purchasing and owning, guns in schools was real, real bad for interstate commerce and hence the national economy. Congress argued that even the potential of gun violence in schools could not only be detrimental to the economies of school districts, but when violence did occur, it would negatively affect travel and tourism. Again, real, real bad for the economy. Furthermore, Congress argued that gun violence and the fear of it alone could negatively affect a child's ability to get a good education. So guns in schools meant a kid may not learn critical educational skills. Again, real, real bad for the economy. Real bad. So there it is. Our mixed smoothie of guns, schools, and the Interstate Commerce Clause. Which brings us to March 10th, 1992, when Alfonso Lopez brought an unloaded 38 caliber gun to school to sell to a friend. Now, acting on a tip, the school confronted Alfonso, who readily admitted that he had the gun. He was then readily arrested and readily charged with violating the Gun-Free Zone Act. 
Of course, Alfonso's lawyers, as well as many conservative constitutionalists, believed that Congress had overstepped its constitutional boundaries and it challenged the constitutionality of the act itself. So now we have ourselves a court case, U.S. versus Lopez. So for the first time since 1937, in a five to four decision authored by then Chief Justice William Rehnquist, the Supreme Court scaled Congress's ability to use the Interstate Commerce Clause back. The opinion found that Lopez's possession of the gun was just simply not economic activity, and it found the government's attempt to justify the act on it affecting the economy a stretch to say the least. Rehnquist outlined three constitutional permissible uses of the Interstate Commerce Clause, and here they are. Number one, the use of channels of interstate commerce. Number two, the instruments of interstate commerce or persons or things in interstate commerce. And number three, activities that substantially affect or substantially relate to interstate commerce. None of these pertain to regulating Lopez's ability to carry a gun within a thousand feet from a school. Carrying a gun near a school was simply not a commercial activity, and it did not substantially affect or relate to interstate commerce. The court basically said, Congress, you done and gone yourselves too far on this one. If the court allowed such a Hail Mary argument, Congress could use the Interstate Commerce Clause to regulate pretty much anything under the sun. Now, to progressives, Lopez was a warning bell that the use of the Interstate Commerce Clause would be in danger, handcuffing Congress's ability to deal with issues of national importance. And five years later, the court would further weaken the Commerce Clause in U.S. versus Morrison, which knocked down key provisions of the Violence Against Women's Act. In a final summarization, you should walk away from Lopez understanding that it was a case that fundamentally began to reshape and redefine federalism, ushering in an era sometimes called new federalism, which empowered states and weakened the federal government's ability to broadly define what constitutes interstate commerce. Wow, we did it. Another Supreme Court gold star for everyone. Thank you for tuning in, and it would just be the tops if you could hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. But whether you're a loyal viewer, a newbie to my channel, a student preparing for a big test, or just cray cray for learning on the internet, I remind you all that where attention goes, energy flows, and I also wish all of you, lovers and haters alike, love and light in your life. And I'll see you the next time you press my button.